The tribes of Israel are named after the sons of Jacob. But if you look at a map that shows the territories of each individual tribe, you'll see two names missing. You won't see the name of Levi, and you won't see the name of Joseph. So the question is, is there a tribe of Joseph? We can tackle the Levi question another time. Short answer, yes, there is a tribe of Joseph. But it has a very unique structure that makes it very different from the other tribes. The tribe of Joseph, as it is sometimes referred throughout the Old Testament, is made up of two half-tribes. These two tribes are the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. These two tribes are named after the sons of Joseph rather than Joseph himself. While they are separate and have their own tribal structure, their own land allotments, and their own leaders, they also function as one tribe in some situations. It's a really unique setup, and I would like to discuss that today. Discuss why on earth the tribe of Joseph is split up in this way, and how this unique arrangement was set up. And through it, we will see Jacob's faith and God's great plan. Let's explain the tribe of Joseph. Before we do that, if you want more Bible study videos explaining these topics as well as going through important Bible passages, subscribe right now, like the video, and comment below what you'd like to see next. Let's get into the Word. The answers we seek are mostly found at the end of Genesis. The final three chapters of Genesis show the family of Israel becoming the nation of Israel. Jacob prepares his family to become a great nation by giving each of his sons a unique blessing in chapter 49. Some of these blessings reflect on the past deeds of the sons and hand down either praise or punishment to them. And other blessings are prophetic that show the future nature and traits of the tribes that would come from each of his sons. But apart from this chapter blessing all 12 of his sons, we have chapter 48. Chapter 48 is dedicated entirely to the events surrounding Jacob blessing the sons of Joseph. That is the story we will examine today. Before we dig into this blessing, let's clear up what blessing really means. What are these words that Jacob is passing on to his children? Throughout that time, blessings were used to pass on the favor, prosperity, even the authority of the father on to his children. For Jacob's family, the blessing was something even greater. It was a way to pass on the promise of God to each son, Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and now Jacob will pass it on as well. First, let's take a look at verses 3 and 4. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me, and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful, and multiply you, and I will make you a company of peoples, and will give this land to your offspring." after you for an everlasting possession. Jacob restates the key parts of his covenant with God that previously God himself restated to Jacob something that he had given as a promise to his ancestor Abraham. Genesis 28 14, your offspring shall be like dust of the earth and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This promise, this covenant with God, has been passed down three generations already. Now Jacob is passing it on to a fourth. In the next verse, Jacob brings the sons of Joseph under this covenant. Verse 5. Now your two sons, who were born to you in the land of Egypt, 
before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are. The sons of Jacob were nearly adults at this point, likely being 18 or 20. And as mentioned in the verse, they were born and raised in Egypt, away from the rest of Joseph's family. As a result, they had very little claim to inheritance with Jacob's family, since they were essentially raised in another family in another culture. Jacob seeks to give the sons legitimacy and a portion in this great blessing that God has promised him by adopting them as his sons. Despite them being raised outside of his family, despite them being born in Egypt, he still brings them into this covenant with God by adopting them, raising them to the positions of sons. As we will see in just a second, they weren't just raised up to become sons of Jacob, but they were raised above the rest of Jacob's sons. The reason for that is this adoptive status didn't just give them the right to be called sons of Jacob, but to be called firstborn sons of Jacob. Let's explain that by taking a look at a couple other verses. Jacob disinherits his true firstborn, Reuben, in chapter 49, in that great blessing chapter where he blesses all the sons. Genesis 49, 4. Unstable as water, you shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it and went up to my couch. This curse removes Reuben's preeminence over his siblings meaning he is no longer able to have the rights and privileges of being a firstborn. While he was a firstborn technically, the power, the authority given to a firstborn was no longer his to claim. Because he, well, he had relations with one of his father's wives. And let's just say Jacob wasn't very happy about that. And that is part of the reason behind that demotion from firstborn. Now, if that wasn't enough evidence that Reuben was removed from firstborn status and Jacob's sons were elevated to that status, we also have some comments from the writer of Chronicles that clarifies this messy familial arrangement up. First Chronicles 5.1 the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn. But because he defiled his father's couch, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he could not be enrolled as the oldest son. Again, this confirms that Reuben, while still firstborn in age and technically, he was removed of all the privileges and the historic rights of the firstborn. But who gains these privileges? The sons of Joseph. So they weren't just adopted as sons, but adopted as firstborn sons. An even greater position that puts them over their other brothers. In these verses, we see that Jacob wanted to bring the Egyptian sons of Joseph into his family to replace the defiant Reuben as firstborn. But there are some other more personal reasons that Jacob chose the sons of Joseph for this exalted position. Verse 7 gives us a more personal memory from Jacob. It gives us additional reasoning behind his choice to elevate the sons of Joseph. As for me, when I came from Paddan, to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan on the way, when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. In the middle of this scene where Jacob is blessing the sons of Joseph, there's this memory this recollection that he communicates to all those present. He remembers the death and burial of his beloved wife, 
Rachel. Rachel was the wife that Jacob truly loved. And it only makes sense to reward that memory of his loving wife by elevating two of her grandsons. Rachel didn't have many children. She only had two. And adopting Manasseh and Ephraim as children of Jacob also adopts them as children of Rachel. Now Rachel has four children. And beyond just adding to the number of Rachel's children in his family, he also blesses his favorite son of Rachel, Joseph. And we see this quite clearly in the next verse. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your offspring also. Joseph was already Jacob's favorite. We see in this verse that Jacob is happy just to see Joseph. He didn't even expect Joseph to be alive. He didn't expect to see Joseph's offspring. And now he wants to bless Joseph, who was recorded all throughout Genesis as his favorite son. Now that Joseph that was dead and is now alive is at Jacob's side as he is on his deathbed. Jacob most certainly would want to elevate Joseph and his lineage by giving his sons the same status as Joseph. He essentially gives Joseph a double portion when it comes to influence and, as we see later in Israel's history, land allotment. I've given a couple reasons why Jacob chose to bring the sons of Joseph into his family in this way and create the unique half-tribes of Joseph. He likely wanted to elevate them and give them legitimacy. He likely wanted to honor the memory of his beloved wife, Rachel. And he wanted to bless the lineage of his favorite son, who he thought was dead, but is now alive. But there is a greater, bigger reason than all three of those that Jacob chose to take this path. And this is where we can learn from this event. Let's see what the author of Hebrews has to say about Jacob adopting the sons of Joseph in the Hall of Faith chapter, chapter 11. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph bowing in worship over the head of his staff. This verse is in the Hall of Faith chapter. It is a chapter that compiles the great faith moments of Old Testament figures. At the beginning of the chapter, the author identifies what faith is. So let's take a look at that so we can figure out where we see faith in this story. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Through these events of adopting these sons of Joseph and passing on the blessing that God had promised his people, he had not seen the blessing that God would give his family. He had not seen what would become of Ephraim and Manasseh, the great tribes that they would become. Yet he still blessed them. Yet he still continues the covenant through the sons of Joseph. Jacob showed great faith in something he would never see. That great covenant, that great promise from God that was passed to him for three generations. Abraham passed the promise to Isaac. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Then Isaac passed that promise by faith to Jacob. Hebrews 11.20 By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. Now Jacob passes that blessing to all of his sons and most of all, the sons of Joseph. He is on his deathbed. He needs a staff to support him. He can barely sit up. And he can barely see. 
yet he uses the last moments of his life to pass on the great blessings, the great covenant that God has promised him and his family because of his faith in God and in what God promised. He was able to bless the sons of Joseph and create the tribe of Joseph. But what is the result of this great promise that Jacob gave his final hours to pass on? And can we receive this promise, this covenant today? If we take a look at the last part of Jacob's promise with God, it reveals something very important. And in you, in your offspring, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. What fulfills this promise and covenant wasn't simply the creation of a nation, but the birth of a Savior, Jesus the Christ. This promise that through Jacob, through Abraham, through Isaac and their lineage, shall all the earth be blessed, was something that none of them saw before their death. But we have. We have seen him. We have seen the fulfillment of this promise. They had faith in something they didn't see. But now we can see it. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Through the pages of the Word and the working of the Spirit, we can see the promise that thousands of years ago, these great patriarchs believed in, had faith in, and they lived by their faith in this promise. Now we can see it. When dead in our sins, Christ came to die for us, to save us, to bless all of us, to give us a great gift. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Now I pray you have accepted this offer to be a part of this great blessing promised to the patriarchs, and now offered to you. And this offer is brought to you by faith. Thank you so much for watching this Chase the Sun video. Comment below if you'd like to learn about the tribe of Levi and their unique tribal structure. And I hope you've been blessed by this video. Be sure to check out some others and stay tuned for more. I'm Chase Carrington. Remember to chase the eternal sun with me.